So rather than rehash some, some of the background themes in this space, which I know get reiterated uh, quite often, I, I did want to jump, jump relatively quickly to some of the meat, meat of the um, presentation today. But to start off with, this is a kind of a brief agenda that we'll go through. Um, the first is just a really basic primer we'll go through quickly on Open Graph, Facebook's uh, API that makes available to brands and commerce sites like yours data about your customers. Um, we'll do a case study with 1-800-Flowers.com. And then if we have time, we'll go into the, the, the last two. But I actually think that the study itself um, provides a very strong uh, um, look into the value of, of open graph and, 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 and connection of social data with the CRM. So we may, not, may have no need, in fact, to go to the, through the rest. So we'll start off with a quick primer on the open graph, Facebook's wondrous API. Um, first, though, uh, really quick about me. Key's already kind of introduced the fact that former uh, CEO of Social Amp, we were acquired in 2012. I do have quite a background in, in Facebook. Um, the 37th application on the Facebook platform, this is back in the days of vampires and whatnot in 2007. Uh, uh, the 37th application I helped to release uh, back then uh, on Facebook. One brand that I like, since we're talking about social CRM data and social CRM profiles, I'm going to offer a little about myself. One brand that I like on Facebook is Vespa. I own a Vespa. And my Facebook user ID, in case you want to jot it down and connect with me later on, is as follows. OK, so first off, I wanted to reproduce a little graphic um, or an idea, a concept that was presented by Mary Meeker. I'm sure everybody know, knows who Mary Meeker is, former research analyst for Morgan Stanley. I believe now she works with a venture capital firm, Kleiner Perkins. But she's really known for her internet trends report. And the latest report, she introduced the concept of you know, uh, three major shifts, paradigm shifts, happening uh, in the web currently. And, and what's possible at the convergence? The shifts were first APIs, the proliferation of APIs. This is something that's happening, that's only been proliferating and happening more quickly. So year to year, we see new content-based APIs, social APIs, functional APIs being introduced. Nothing new there. Um, connected data, that's kind of new, right? So the idea of, first of all, really big data, which I know everybody is very familiar with. And you know, McKinsey may have popularized the term in 2011 with their, you know, their, their report, but, but you know, frankly speaking, any manager for any one of the brands present here were probably dealing with it, dealing with it way, way, way well before then. Um, so that the idea of, of deriving value from connecting data across your organizational silos, that's really kind of connected CRM. And the third is beauty, UX, which is interesting, right? Because as an as a online retailer, you're really concerned about optimizing every pixel on your site, particularly your product page. Things like performance uh, time and response time are, are usually, usually trump everything else. But then you get new innovations uh, and layouts like Pinterest coming in. And really, the one offering they have is just a, a very well-designed front end. And it, it starts opening up ideas. So the, the idea is, what is possible at the convergence? And she termed everything, which is kind of tra traumatizing for an e-commerce manager a bit, right? Because, you know. We're already at a point where ideas tested, tried, and true have been challenged historically on a yearly or bi-yearly basis. And now you find yourself every quarter, if not every month, having to deal with a new development that may you know, fundamentally undermine what you're currently doing. So it's, it's a bit traumatizing, but if you, can, if you can harness it, it's very empowering. And hopefully that's what the open graph is. We'll speak about it. A little more about the, you know, um, this concept of social product engineering. Each of these companies were companies highlighted in that report that are doing something at that convergence, really, really um, you know, uh, generating new product innovation and developing kind of new ideas. And of course, what they have in common is they all have a social and personalized feel. So that's to suggest in that overlap that we saw, perhaps the leading foot is in fact social, right? So CRM, UX, beauty, APIs, that if the companies that are really innovating tend to have a social and personalized feel to them that perhaps leading with your social foot is not a bad idea. And of course, today's topic is social CRM. So that's why I show that. But then again, personalization has been around for a while. right? So you've known some set of attributes about your customers, your name, address, contact, et cetera, for quite a while through other methods. You know, the, the behavioral attributes, site browsing attributes of your customers has been available and will continue to be available with you know, basic pixeling and cookie and retargeting and whatnot. So the question is, you know, what has social brought to the game? 
right? So if, if, if some form of this data, perhaps more inferred rather than declared, is available, you know, what has social brought to the game from an explicit retargeting standpoint for a marketer? And we call this here, you know, at Merkle Social, really three explicit social truths. It's pretty simple. It's names, faces, and friends. So again, you think of the value of Facebook's Open Graph in particular, you know, having access to who your customer is intimately, um, and intimately in this case being something as simple as a true profile image of who they are, and access to their friends results in tremendous amounts of personalization you can do that you probably have experienced, but you just haven't noticed it. So I took a few screenshots here. One example is TripAdvisor. I'm sure a network that everybody uses every time they, review, they, they seek reviews for, for traveling. This is actually a, a screenshot of my homepage without touching anything. If I just load TripAdvisor right now, this is what you're going to see. And immediately, the first thing I see are reviews are, that are personalized for me, friends that have reviewed destinations that I'm interested in. So they, they know the destinations I'm interested in because I've indicated through my behavioral attribute profiling or you know, through what I like, where I want to go. But then they've also surfaced reviews about those places for my friends, as well as friends of friends. So this type of hyper-social personalization is being done. And it's being done by aggressive companies like TripAdvisor and you know, to their benefit. I mean, just do a little research and see how they're doing. And it kind of speaks for itself, so I won't go into that. Uh, others examples from a kind of an e-tail perspective. This is a more historical example, an example actually that you know, social amps technology helped to power back in 2010, kind of the early days of this stuff. Um, in this case, personalizing the shopping cart um, rec and, and providing shopping cart recommendations for customers based upon what their friends had browsed, liked, wanted, or purchased. Uh, again, these, these are examples that have been done in the marketplace and to strong effect. Uh, you know, Levi's currently is, is, is do doing very well. They have grown their uh, uh, you know, e-tail revenue uh, amount 50% you know, year to year for the past two years now. So they're doing very well. So of course, names, faces, and friends made possible by the open graph. You like this, right? Why do you like this? To reiterate, first off, big channel. It's a tremendous source of referral traffic. Uh, this is, again, this is a, a graphic taken from Mary Meeker's report. And in this case, it's a content publisher, a site called Viddy, uh, onboarding 17 million users in seven days. Now, I'm going to caveat that and that sure, they were early mover advantage, and sure, Facebook perhaps prioritized some of their newsfeed impressions to show a case, you know, kind of a case leading example in the market. But nonetheless, the fact that they can even do that goes to show there's some tremendous you know, referral and channel advantages to the open graph. Uh, you know, E-commerce oriented products like fab.com, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, if not, take a look at it, have also integrated open graph with similar results. The other, which has been mentioned in previous uh, uh, talks here today, is data. Data, 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 right? So, you know, it's, it's important here to focus a bit, you know, why Facebook Open Graph, why, why prioritize Facebook Open Graph over some of the other platforms? Nobody's saying, you know, ditch your Twitter strategy or you know, ditch your Tumblr or YouTube strategy, but we're saying, where are you gonna put most of your eggs? If you only have so many, if you only have so many baskets, where are you gonna put most of your eggs into? Which basket? And you know, the idea here is that Facebook at 900 million users, unique users a month, average, right? At, you know, active users, they are the richest and deepest source of social data about your customers, hands down. Hands down, that's a fact. And as a result of being such a you know, deep platform with so much data about your customers, they provide the strongest foundation to provide some of those personalized experiences I just showed you a second ago. across across your programs, on your site, and email, because there's so much data. And the third is, of course, you know, the retargeting opportunities are, are endless. We showed you the graphic earlier. So, so there is a, a certain advantage to you know, focus and prioritizing your social efforts on one platform or another, and it should be done in an analytical way, right? Just like you do all your other business. Okay, so before we go into the Flowers case study, one last kind of, kind of phenomena. The first wave of social was push. I won't go into too much into this. We all realize this. You know, if you recall the early days, everybody's racing for likes, and it gets to level, level of ridiculousness where a content network like CNN is competing with a celebrity like Ashton Kutcher for followers and, and, and whatnot. It just, it's, it's kind of funny to look back and see that that actually happened. Um, but the second wave, of course, is more germane to who you are. It's existentialist. It's, it's really about who am I, who is my customer, and it's more of a pull phenomenon. 
It's the realization that that data is, in fact, out there, that it, 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 could, it can, in fact, be acquired in scale and in a privacy-friendly way. So let's go out there and get that. And more importantly, once we get it, let's connect it with HistoryRM and, and milk the, uh, you know, the retargeting capacities. So before we go into the case study, three final hard facts that even if you've heard these before, it's worth reiterating because at the end of the day, you have a, uh, a budget that you need to allocate and it's, 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 you, know, you want to know the hard facts before you allocate them, even in Facebook, determining where within Facebook you should allocate it. But the majority of Facebook users, according to Facebook's own SN1 uh, profile or you know, a release they did before their IPO, is that 50% of their users out, uh, operate outside the typical Facebook experience. So 50% of Facebook users do not interact within Facebook's walls, but in fact operate outside Facebook's walls, meaning third-party sites. Meaning it's like TripAdvisor, where they're on TripAdvisor, but they're interacting with their customer network, meaning mobile. So that's an important point. To put all, again, your eggs in one basket and, and forming a fan page is not really the way to do it. The second is 27% of time spent within Facebook. So of those Facebook users who are within Facebook walls, 27% of their time is on the Facebook newsfeed. So where does that leave like brand pages and content, you know, your kind of your earned or owned media strategy? It's kind of minuscule frankly, it's kind of minuscule. And then the third is the average brand in the top 100 Facebook pages, uh, this is according to Facebook, their own kind of um, um, releases, is that only, they, they reach only a maximum 16% of their fans per week if they post five days a week. So there's a limit to how much of those fans you can actually reach within the news feed where they spend the 27% of their time. So we're talking about really minuscule, and this shouldn't be surprising because in the larger web, um, you know, from a platform perspective, the internet wins, right? You know, and Facebook, is, Facebook has known this for a while. That's why they've introduced the Open Graph well over two years ago. Their mindset is how do you leverage the customer's network outside our walls and on your own brand site? Because that's ultimately where your you know, users are spending most of their time. So let's get into a, a case study here with One Hair Flowers, a very kind of valued client of ours where we've you know, worked with them for quite a while now. And you know, I think One Hair Flowers as an organization you know, just really gets it. And you know, they have a, a tremendous culture and a tremendous philosophy you know, the first thing is, this, you know, this kind of spelled it to me when I first started working with them. Their CEO and their, their entire organization, they really believe they're in the business of delivering smiles. So you go there and you think you're buying a product, you know, a uh, you know, product, maybe some kind of a commodity, flowers, but they, they inherently as an organization look at it, you know, we're actually, we're actually selling smiles. And, and, and it's that type of kind of philosophy the, uh, of clients that we like to work with. Um, the second thing is, you know, they really believe on a fundamental level that social connections and the way I just spoke earlier you know, really drive gift, 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 gift giving in all its forms. So whether social connections between friends, couples, coworkers, whatever it be, a tremendous capacity to drive gift gifting. So that's just a little background on, on the client in this case. You know, the case study was as follows, is that Flowers had, like any other brand, invested a tremendous amount of money um, across, you know, different um, solutions. They wanted to see where they could drive more ROI. And we, you know, worked with them on connecting their social CRM audiences in the four following ways. Integrating your customer's Facebook network into the shopping experience. We'll show examples of that. Integrate customer's product sharing into user's news feed or Facebook timeline. Distribute socially personalized emails. We'll show an example of that. Leverage social data to outperform with Facebook media. So the key to those four points, those are all values or solutions that we were able to deploy as a result of collecting the social data on their customers. And we'll show examples of each. So the, the process and the way our technology generally works is we are an on-site, we are a platform that has created a number and a, a, a myriad of different social applications that can work with content publishers or, or you know, uh, gift, gift retail sites or you know, traditional retail sites, apparel retail sites. And these apps live somewhere within your site. They can live on a product page. They can live on its own unique page, you know, oneherflowers.com slash social. They can live anywhere on your site. The key is it's within a domain where your customer is already engaging. There's a natural traffic flow there. There's a connection experience we offer. Again, we provide the user some social experience that they inherently value, that leverages their customer network. And in turn, as a result of that, and I'll show you examples in a second, we're able to acquire social data about them and who their friends are and their friends. And so the, the, the process of creating connections starts with a meaningful on-site social application that the user encounters in interacting with your brand, a permission process, and then us gathering the data and, and doing some of the magic behind the scenes. So, you know, the first application we introduced was a very basic application called you know, a birthday app, birthday widget on their product page. So we talked a second ago that you know, this concept of 
your product page being sacrosanct and holy, and no doubt it is, and that every pixel counts for something. Here's a top 40 internet retailer, right, devoting the entire right-hand rail to a social experience. That makes sense for them. In this case, customers get to see their Facebook friends' birthdays that are coming up within the site, in case that's not clear. Some, for some reason, I still, as many of these talks that I give, it still kind of blows people that the experience here is outside of Facebook. The customer network is with you wherever you are. So you may be shopping for flowers or candies for a, an uncle or a mother, and you notice that, in fact, it's a close friend of yours, Sergio, Sergio's birthday coming up. You know, what the hey? It's $25 for you know, a box of candies. I'm going to buy it for him. It's a nice surprise, right? That kind of impulse-driven purchase funnel, which you know, is, is spoken about so much in the social circles. So that's the first application we enabled with them. And, and the way it worked is very simple. It was an on-site application on 1-800-Flowers.com within their product pages, um, essentially a widget on the right-hand side. There's a natural funnel there, because there's natural organic traffic that's hitting that product page. Plus, they leverage their CRM programs, email, Twitter page, Facebook page, to drive users to these experiences. Uh, when a user sees this widget, if they're not already authenticated or connected, you know, Facebook, Facebook likes to call it authentication. If they're not already authenticated with your domain, and it's a one-time process, by the way, then you know, there's a nice teaser that tells the user, hey, you know, forget your friend's birthdays, or you want to know what friend's birthdays are coming up. You connect, there's a one-time permission screen, and then if the user accepts on a one-time basis, on an ongoing basis for the rest of that user's life, when they hit their product page, you have access to their data, and you can personalize the social experience on your site. One-time process. And within this funnel that you saw in the middle, this is kind of our philosophy at SocialNet, this idea of a fair value exchange where only ask for what, the, what makes sense to the user. So for a birthday application, you know, we're not going to ask for their photos. Why, why do you need my photos? But we, ask, we are going to ask for their birthday and their friend's birthday so that we can provide them this experience. And it's intuitive to them, so our conversion rate is fairly high. right? In the industry, conversion on this dialogue could be anywhere from low as 15% and as high as 85%. You know, we're as high as 75% for some clients. That's because we create and design intuitive on-site social experience that makes sense to the user. So that's kind of the flow of the application, how we actually acquire the social CRM data. And again, when we acquire that data, and it will be reiterated later on, for each user, we get the user's information and their friend's information. So it scales like nothing else. It's exponential. You know, with 5,000 authenticated users, you have access to almost 1.2 million social users' worth of information. So it scales tremendously. Um, as you see, this FB permissioning process unlocks traditional data. This is a subset of data on, a, let's say, a given user. They're male, they're 28, they live in New York City, some of their other brand likes, ESPN, Adidas, Canon, um, some of their specific likes that they've mentioned, uh, open graph likes, and then you merge that with CRM, and all of a sudden you can create segmentation on not only who this user is from a social profile standpoint, what they like, who they are, how influential they are, but from a customer segmentation standpoint, meaning, you know, hmm, interesting. I see that when I segment my users on value, uh, there's, there's a correlation between high value customers and a social profile like this. Let me go buy more users who have a social profile like this. Let me go to my media, my Facebook media, and buy users like that because they're a high value or they're a high email engager. This is basic segmentation that, you know, if you have a, any analyst or analytics guy at your organization, they can run. But you just need access to the data. And to get access to the data, you need a smart experience on your site. Um, so from a Merkle perspective, and this is what really excites me about you know, Merkle's capabilities, now part of the Merkle family, they have a deep, deep kind of roots in, in CRM and connected CRM and this philosophy, which you know, their CEO, the first day I met him, just, it just rung completely true, that ultimately old data is siloed and, and, and social data, as valuable as it is, is not that valuable if you don't complement it with the other data sources, right? So in our case, we needed access to transactions. And working with Merkle and their analytics teams and their capabilities and their existing databases, we were e immediately able to make that connection and, 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 and suss out an ROI in some of this stuff. And I'll show you in a second what we saw with some of our clients. But you know, the idea overview here is deploy Open Graph app on your site. The visitor authenticates. You scale it because every user authenticates. You get their information and their friend's information. And then you, you integrate it with the other kind of CRM data within your organization. Hopefully, you have a Merkle helping you do that. These are some of the other applications we did on site, right? So your traditional UGC campaign, which you do inside of Facebook, or you do it on a microsite, you can leverage a subdomain of your site, blank.com slash social, blank.com slash photo contest. And this way, that social graph is happening on your site. When users are commenting, in this case, it was a, 
a kind of a friendly dog competition. Flowers customers, you know, love their dogs, and they actually create a product line called Adogable around that. That's how powerful the concept is. But for every comment and photo and video uploaded, rather than taking their friends to a, a Facebook application or a Facebook page, it takes them to this site. And then once it takes them to this site, you know, Flowers is smart enough to marry coupons on that page to try to drive that social user to purchase. This is the concept of activating social graph on site. These are some of the other kind of campaigns on site. It's all that we did with them. Essentially a reskinning, the same photo application on site, reskin for Halloween, for Christmas, and the previous one was, which was a, a special adoggable campaign. Um, email targeting, right? So we talk about the social CRM profile that we traditionally have. How do we, how do we feed that to a customer? How do we have that influence our email program? Well, in the case of Flowers, it was also very intuitive. Through their existing uh, uh, e uh, email service provider, ESP, we were able to leverage our API and theirs to deploy socially personalized email. So within the body of the email, I'm seeing my friend's name, a picture, and gift suggestions to what to buy them. If that user ever liked anything on that site, we're going to suggest that item. And if not, we're going to suggest, on a, uh, we're going to suggest based on other criteria, like the fact that he's a male, or that he's a male who likes you know, dogs, so let's suggest an adoggable product, right? Um, and then what was interesting here, and this is what really drove tremendous ROI for them, that subject line, Charles Wilson, Susan, those are all, that subject line is personalized, it's actually mentioning my friends' names. So as a result, we saw a 10x increase in click-through rate on this email versus the traditional product newsletter. It's something as simple as personalizing the subject line. And these are examples of, you know, explicit social personalization with data. Uh, permission data plus CRM equals smarter media. So this is increasingly, I think, where really the space is going, right? So um, you know, I'm here evangelizing, obviously, social and social data. You know, that's my space, and that's my job. But I think from a bigger picture, it really is it's a big data play. And organizationally, you have to have the ability to bridge those silos that exist to connect one data stream with the other. But when you do that, you get some tremendous results. So what Facebook has introduced now with their kind of new laxing of regulations and, and, and privacy policies, or in terms of use with their data. For all the open graph data you capture about your customers for your brand, that data can then be used to merge with your, the other data you have about the customer, you know, the, the customer profiles built upon you know, cookies and behavior attributes and whatnot, to retarget, right? So back to that first example where I showed you that that social profile was shown to be a high value user. The type, that type of social profile was correlated with a user who buys a lot. Then you can go and buy that, pro, buy that on Facebook media. You can go there and actually purchase it. You ever, if you've ever been kind of underwhelmed by the performance of Facebook media, you're not leveraging Facebook's data, right? So Facebook's kind of like this, this, this pipe. They're giving you this mechanism to, to grab their customer data in a permissive way. And they're saying, OK, now spend it back on us <laughs> right through our media. But it works because you're able to create that, that ideal profile of the customer that you want to buy. Um, so this is, this, this is I, I really think, this is where the space is going increasingly, the merging of, of social data with other data sites to, to drive smarter media, both in Facebook and ultimately off of Facebook as well. So some quick results. I already mentioned this earlier, but you know, the social email campaign saw you know, a 10x increase in consumer engagement. Um, you know, driven. It just goes to show you that it doesn't take much with this social data to just you know, open eyes. Um, the key is you want to do it in a, in a tasteful way in a privacy-friendly way, and, and that's what we value ourselves with our platform. And then overall, you know, through the course of our, you know, we've almost been with Flowers for two years, and I'll tell you a bit how we did this analysis, but what we, what we looked at was, we looked at all the connected users that were driven to, to Flowers and connected through that Facebook dialog screen, and then Flowers matched that against their customer database to see how many of those users were new purchasers, right? So these are first-time users now. They see first-time inclusion in customer database. Average order value, whatever, $65. You know, benchmark at $2 million, right? So uh, this is kind of a back of the envelope calculation, frankly. It's, not even, it's, not, it's not, not, not even more exact than that. But it goes to show you that you know, if, if leveraged, and also goes to show you that you know, social is not a tool. You know, it's, it's, it, it, there are productivity tools there, right? There are tools, social tools, that provide and save time for your admins you know, to post once, and it goes on your Tumblr page, and your YouTube page, and your Twitter page. And you know, that's valuable. That's productivity. But if you want it to drive bottom line ROI, like actual money, I hate to be that vulgar, but you know, if, that's what, if you want to drive, you have to use it in a kind of an enterprise fashion. Have that data feed the, across the entire organization. And then you can achieve results like this. 
Okay, five minutes. Um, so I'm almost done actually here. We can open up for questions. So, you know, a few lessons here. First, don't treat social in a silo. You know, um, and again, as an entrepreneur, uh, you know, I feel very proud of this because, you know, we did end up merging and working out with a CRM company that specialized in this, taking data and merging it together to create value. So, um, you know, this graphic is interesting. It just goes to show you that, you know, ultimately your ability to, um, you know, produce change, let's call it that, value, is just a function of the data you have access to. So whatever knowledge gap you have, you know, um, if you can bridge that, so that's usable data and that's available data, right? It goes to show you that no matter how much data you think you have access to, there's always more to be had, right? And social is like right below voice and video there. Um, so the first step is really kind of growing that data. And the second is plan for the future state of CRM. So what I, what I shared with you today is actually being done now. There are solutions available now. I think the future state, like I said, is the larger kind of you know, issue here is you know, how do you merge this data to create value. So what we've already begun thinking on behalf of our clients is you know, let's start segmenting the different types of data and see how they can work together. So on one hand, you have anonymous user data. This is like site behavioral data, product views, clicks. They're associated with a cookie, but there's still value there, right? And there's been value there proven by you know, this type of targeting done historically on e-commerce sites. You have campaign data. Then you also have like, more known PII information about the user data. That's like transaction history, who the customer is, contact history. And then the third is what we call this kind of known, you can call it socially connected customer data, right? The user's open graph profile. Um, you know, to what degree you connect with other networks. You know, Twitter has some value from a social perspective, social stream perspective, but again, it's primarily Facebook because users are most active there. They actually voluntarily give information about themselves. So those are kind of the three buckets. And then you know, how, do we, how do we define these and look at these in a way where we then clean it up and, and, and pr can produce some really smart algorithmic, uh, algorithmic abilities to segment and score users that then can result in real-time output. So all of a sudden, the product recommendation engine you have on your site is not only informed by anonymous user information, but it's informed by all three. Right? Now, this is future state. So if you're looking at this and you're like sweating, don't worry about it. This is, like, this is a year away, a year and a half away. But I show this just to, just to, just to prove the point that ultimately you do want to work with a partner that gets this inherently. Because if they don't have this in mind, if this is not what they're working towards, then you know, unfortunately they're just another social vendor coming in and going to go. That's, just, that's the reality. So, Final slide here before we bring questions. You know, what does it take to drive ROI at scale through social commerce? You know, at a very basic level, these on-site social apps make your customers experience better. They value your brand more. They enjoy you know, uh, having access to their, their friends and, 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 and being able to socially engage on your site. Uh, the second is the realization that, yeah, again, your customer's social network is not limited within Facebook walls. It's ubiquitous. So let's use it on site, let's use it in email, let's use it in our media, search. Eventually this data is going to work its way into your search you know, keyword bid strategy as well. Let's use it across kind of the CRM. And the authentication strategy, it's a network effect, right? So for every user, it has on average 200, 250 friends. Let's treat that with an analytical lens to maximize the amount of social CRM data we get so that we can actually use this stuff. And then fourth, you know, I've been trumpeting this point all presentation long, I'll do it one more time, connect the CRM. Whatever organizational issues you have right now and not being able to, to bridge those silos, resolve them. Or work with a partner that can help you resolve that. Hint Merkel is one of them. That's it. Thanks.